The eleventh Sunday after Trinity, O God, who declares thy almighty power, chiefly in showing mercy and pity, mercifully grant unto us such a measure of thy grace, that we, trusting in Christ alone, and running in the way of his commandments, may obtain to your gracious promises, and be made partakers of the heavenly treasures, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ascension Day, hymn 215, verse 1. See the conqueror mounts in triumph. See the king in royal state, riding on the clouds, his chariot to heavenly palace gate. Hark the choir of angels, voices joyful, alleluias sing, and the portals high are lifted to receive their heavenly king. Well, we finally return to Dr. James Davison Hunter's Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America. And he's been discussing the subject of competing moral visions between the, what he calls progressives and the orthodox. Under the orthodox, he includes those with such as those Christians that have the Bible as their standard of orthodoxy, Jews, conservative Jews who have the Old Testament as their standard, and, and of course Roman Catholics with their papal standards. So we return here on page 123, the progressivist appeal to authority. we we'll jump in here. There is, therefore, no objective and finally, re final revelation, speaking of the progressivists, directly from God and scripture, of whatever form is not revelation, but only, and at best, a witness to revelation. How very Bardian. The moral and spiritual truths of religious faith can only come to human beings indirectly. And they can only be understood and expressed in human, which is to say in historical and institutional terms. Thus, moral and spiritual truth can only be conditional and relative. The orientation is well as illustrated by the views of both Richmond Young and B. Blair. I call her B. Blair, Blair the Episcopal Priestette. Richmond chose to embrace Catholicism in part because he believed that the Catholic Church was not bound by the doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture. What is more, the magisterium, in his view, may be an agent of divine truth, but in the end it is a human and therefore fallible institution. A similar attitude about the humanity of Scripture is taken by blaring B. Blair, she, of course, is not a literalist. Scripture, she says, must be interpreted, not taken at face value. In a negative way, this view is acknowledged by the progressivists' adversaries as well. Yehuda's complaint about liberal and secular Jews like Harriet Woods is that they do not consider themselves bound by the sources they do not give any legitimacy to the Talmud. They are not bound by the code of Jewish law or the halakha or even bound to what Maimonides, the great formulator of classical Judaism says or anything else for that matter. They make the rules as they play the game. I don't think they can deny this. This is also the criticism that Chuck Michelin directed at the liberal churchmen and women supported uh, the domestic partners proposal in San Francisco. They reject what the Bible says about itself. They say it is not inspired, that it's just a human book like anything else. For this reason, the legacy of faith for progressivists becomes valuable not as their literal account of historical personalities and events in relation to God, 
but primarily as a narrative that points to ethical principles that can be applied to contemporary human experience. In the case of scriptural hermeneutics, what is important in the scriptural accounts of God's dealings with his people is not whether they literally occurred, but what they symbolize about human relationships. To say that the progressivist wings of Protestantism, Catholicism, and Judaism have largely rejected the absolute authority of their tradition is not, therefore, to suggest that their traditions have become in any way irrelevant or socially impotent. The traditions still provide a powerful sense of continuity with the past <clears throat> and form a style of communal worship and interpersonal solidarity, principles that have as their ultimate end the fulfillment of human needs and aspirations. And we'll just interject here, Old Testament, New Testament, systematics, church history, practical theology. But now we're out here in the arena of contemporary theology. We're at um, some of the, we're not going to get those other disciplines from Dr. Hunter. So we come, we don't leave our disciplines at the door to accommodate a sociologist of religion. We listen to him. But we listen critically. We can see a deep affinity between the cultural hermeneutics of the liberal religious belief and of civic humanism. Both activist humanists, we would call them dehumanists, is found in such groups as the American Dehumanist Association, Ethical Culture, and the Council for Democratic and Secular Dehumanism. And I'm substituting the word here. And the larger non-activist secularist public reject the validity of any traditional religious symbols and rituals. They also tend to be particularly hostile toward orthodox religious belief. But there are important positive affinities between religious and secular progressives as well. Like their pop counterparts during the classical era, era, the Italian Renaissance, and the French Enlightenment. The contemporary expressions are of a religious humanism. How about religious dehumanism? Also maintain the fundamental conviction that moral truth is perpetually unfolding. That moral truth is a human construction, therefore is both conditional and relative and very contrary to St. Paul in Romans 1. And that moral truths should reflect ethical principles that have the human good as their highest end. In sum, within the broader progressivist alliance, both religious and secular, moral authority emerges primarily, if not exclusively, within this worldly considerations. The inner worldly sources of moral authority may vary in at least two ways. First, the progressive conception can be based in what would be called the self-grounded rational discourse. In, 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 in intellectual terms, this is the tradition of enlightenment naturalism of Thomas Hobbes, the enlightenment encyclopedists, Baron de Holbach, John Dewey, Wilfred von Orman Quine, Wilfred Sellers, and others. Here in principle, moral positions and influence are justified solely on the grounds of evidence about the human condition and consistency of the arguments seduced. Not only are the nature of reality and the foundations of knowledge established by the adequacy of empirical proofs uncovered and the quality and coherence of logic applied. But in this frame of reference, autonomous rationality and empirical meta method become the decisive criteria for evaluating the credibility and usefulness of all moral claims as well. In other words, the 51% vote. 
In the more extreme scientific formulations, it is argued that there is no reality except that which science is shown to exist, which again you see the presupp metaphysical presupposition and the epistemological dogmatism. No truth except that such claims are common in debates, often in the context of a lawsuit over medical policy, educational policy, or other forms of public policy, or the ethics of particular act action, say in the area of genetic therapy, or the value of educational curricula, on the promotion of child care regulations depend upon scientific proof that people are helped or at least not hurt <clears throat> by that course of action. If expert knowledge from, say, educational or family psychologists <clears throat> can show that a course of action has no untoward psychological effects in pe on people, then the action is morally permissible. On a second and very different plane of moral reasoning, the progressivist concept of moral authority may be based upon personal experience. So the book of Judges, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. This is probably the dominant basis of moral reasoning on this side of the cultural divide. In intellectual terms, this is the tradition of enlightenment, subjectivism, Kant, existentialism, and the various streams of Heideggerian hermeneutical philosophy, such as is found in Wittgenstein and Richard Rorty. In this case, experience is ordered. Moral judgments are made according to a logic rooted in subjective intuition and understanding. The premise here is that by virtue of our symbolic activity, we human beings are responsible for the way the world is. The moral logic of this position, as it translates into popular culture, has been described in numerous ways by social scientists in recent years. The concept implies moral pragmatism centered around the individual's perception of his own emotional needs or psychological disposition. In this situation, reason linked with keen awareness of subjective orientation provides the ultimate crucible for determining what is right, wrong, legitimate, and illegitimate, and ultimately what is evil and good. The cl cliche that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder is expanded and elevated to the status of a fundamental moral principle, that what people view as ultimately true, morally good, worthwhile, artistically pleasing, sens sensually pleasurable, and so on, resides wholly in the private realm or whim of an individual. Private perspectives are inextricably bound to the individual's unique collection of experiences in some ways, biography is the main foundation of truth. As with our, our orthodoxy, a list, if you will, of specific precepts tend to emanate from the progressivist concepts of moral authority. Among the most relevant here are the assumptions that personhood begins at or close to the moment of birth at least until science can prove otherwise. Likewise, until science, uh, likewise, until science can prove otherwise, male and female are differentiated solely by biology. Other differences are probably human construction imposed through socialization, reinforced in human relationships by powerful and sometimes oppressive institutions. So too, human sexuality is based in biological need. The forms in which those needs are met historically, culturally variable and completely legitimate as long as those forms reflect the positive and caring relationship. 
Homosexuality then does not represent an absolute and fundamental perversion of nature, but simply one way in which nature can evolve and be expressed. As one gay activist put it, we should appropriate our sexuality not as something biologically necessitated or socially coerced, but as a freely chosen way of expressing our authentic humanness in relation to the special others with whom we wish to share our lives. And like marriage and family structures are historically and culturally shared, their form by and large depends upon the need and circumstance the Orthodox communities order themselves, live by, and build upon the substance of shared commitment to transcendent truths and moral traditions that uphold them. The very identity of those communities is boundly t bound tightly around that tradition. Moral authority on the progressivist side of the cultural divide tends not to be burdened by the weight of either natural law religious prerogative, or traditional communal authority. As Merleman puts it, it is loose-bounded authority, detached from cultural moorings of traditional group membership. As such, it carries few, if any, of the burdens of the past. Memory does not inhibit change. Authority is distinctively forward-looking, open-ended, and malleable. Thus, this form of moral authority that is uniquely shaped by and oriented toward legitimating the prevailing zeitgeist or spirit of the age. Again, we're talking about competing moral visions here. A few more pages to go. Moral authority and political experience. <clears throat> the orthodox and progressivist conceptions of moral authority and the range of specific assumptions that follow from them are obviously more complex than the rough sketches presented here. Nonetheless, what is important is that they bear on political philosophy and practice in direct ways. The most obvious way is with regard to controversial issues of the day abortion, the ERA, gay rights, educational policy, and the like. The assumptions and interests of each alliance preclude or endorse the specific pro proposals from the outset. Moral logic reflects those interests and assumptions. Thus, for example, abortion is murder and must be stopped if human life is defined as beginning at conception. Legalized abortion is morally acceptable and therefore a viable public policy if life is defined at beginning with the first breath at birth or perhaps the third or even second trimester of pregnancy. By a similar logic, homosexuality is a perversion if the only legitimate sexuality is between a man and a woman. Homosexuality between consenting adults is acceptable the sodomy laws anachronistic if we assume that there are many justifiable ways of satisfying human biological needs. Equalizing the role of women will be undesirable if it appears to threaten the traditional patriarchal family structure. If the bourgeois family is regarded as just one possible familial arrangement and one that tends in practice to be oppressive, Legislation on behalf of the rights of women will seem both fitting and desirable. Similarly, direct correspondence between assumptions and policy positions could be found vis-a-vis -vis the day daycare debate, the eugenics controversy, euthanasia, the many issues that make up the disputes over religion and public education, and a host of other issues. But the relationship between moral authority and political expedience goes beyond the predictable responses to policy issues. It is often asked, for example, 
a fundamentalist view leads to the opposition to America's relinquishing control over the Panama Canal, or how being a liberal Catholic leads one to support a proposition of comparable worth. On the face of it, having certain religious commitments does not seem to have anything at all in common with specific certain political commitments. Yet seemingly strange patterns of alliance constantly surface in political life. Perhaps the best answer to questions like these is simply to say that there is a loose affinity between religious orientation and political opinions. Specifically, there seems to be a loose affinity or isomorphism between religious conservatives and political preser preservationism on the one hand, between religious and even secular or liberalism and political reformism on the other. These general affinities lead people of particular cultural orientations to not so predictable political commitments. This might explain why, for example, the religiously orthodox tend to be more disposed toward a strong military and an aggressive foreign policy. The religious self-identity of the orthodox groups draws much from America's role as a world power, for example, by checking godless communist expansion, by defending Israel and so on. Religious war interests are at least indirectly tied to America's geopolitical interests. This isomorphism is also partial, uh, partially explains the opposing relationships between religion and capitalism, particularly in Protestantism. The religious individualism of the American Protestantism and economic individualism mirror each other in much the same way as religious communalism and economic collectivism. It might also explain why both orthodox and progressivist camps correctly accuse each other of supporting policies that engender the intrusion of the state into private life. <clears throat> the enactment of law that endorses a shifting cultural climate will be perceived as an intrusion by those who resist the present cultural changes. The reversal of these laws or an attempt to prohibit their enactment will be perceived as an intrusion by those who approve of these changes and whose interests are served by them. In separate worlds, the central dynamic of the cultural realignment is not merely that different public philosophies create different public opinions. These alliances reflect the institutionalization and the politicization of the fundamentally different cultural systems. Each side operates from within its own constellation of values, interests, and assumptions. At the center of each are two distinct conceptions of moral authority, two different ways of apprehending reality, of ordering experience, of making moral judgments. Each side of the cultural divide then speaks with a different moral vocabulary. Each side operates with a different mode of debate and persuasion. Each side represents the tendencies of a separate, separate and competing moral galaxy. They are indeed worlds apart. The interminable character of moral debate. As a consequence of this moral estrangement, concessions on many policy matters become a virtual impossibility. The abortion debate exemplifies this poignantly particularly the voices of those who care most passionately about the outcome. No one on the pro-life side of this controversy doubts that God's gift of life begins at conception. How do we know this? The Bible clearly states that life begins at conception. Thus, the Old and New Testament texts are copiously cited. 
what is more, modern science also demonstrates that there is life in the womb. After all, the unborn child has a beating heart in 24 days, brain waves and unique fingerprints at 43 days, a complete skeleton and reflexes at six weeks, and so on. Abortion, therefore, could never be anything else than the killing of innocent life. For this reason, the abortion of 22 million fetuses between 1973 and 1978 is nothing short of mass genocide. The moral choice then is clear. One is, as the Methodist for Life brochure puts it, either for life or against life, for Jesus or against Jesus. The moral logic is fundamentally different on the pro-choice side of the controversy. Arguments also grounded in theological and scientific insight show that there's an important distinction between potential life and actual life, and that fetuses are not of equal moral value with actual persons. After all, the biblical characterization of human beings is that of a complex, many-sided creature with the godlike ability and responsibility to make choices the fetus hardly meets those characteristics, it is argued. And I think we will take leave there. It's the book of Judges. It's the spirit that the prophets had to engage. It's the city of God versus the city of man. One city, they love God, who he is, his authority, his word. The other city is full of self-love, narcissism, subjectivism, and all the other isms, the dehumanists. But we're thankful that he's raising the issue. This is out here in contemporary theology. We bring our whole baggage over in to bear in on the dehumanists. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, save this nation, we pray. Have mercy. Cause a cultural, political transformation through the voices of your people. And if not, then, Lord, we know what the consequences will be. Judgment. Whoever you see fit, and whenever you see fit. Spare us that, O oh Lord, by converting many and changing many so that things may change. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.